स्वास्थान प्राज्ञ सप्तांग एको न विंशति मुख प्राविक्त भुक्जसो द्वितीय पाद Taijasa is the second quarter, whose sphere of activity is the dream state, whose consciousness is internal, who is possessed of seven limbs and nineteen mouths, and who enjoys subtle objects. Shankaracharya's Tika, Taijasa that has the dream state as his sphere of activity is Svapnastana. The consciousness of the waking state, though it is a state of mental vibration, is associated with many means, and it appears to be engrossed in external objects, and thus it leaves in the mind the corresponding impressions. Under the impulsion of ignorance, desire, and past action, the mind, thus possessed of the impressions like a piece of painted canvas, makes its appearance in the dream state. Just as in the waking state, but without any external means. In line with this is the statement: When he dreams, he takes away a little of the impressions of this all-embracing world, the waking state. Brihadaranyaka four three nine. Similarly, in the Upanishad of the Atharva Veda, after introducing the subject with. All senses become one in the highest deity, the mind. It is said, here in this dream state, the deity, the mind, experiences greatness. Prashnopanishad four five. The mind is antaha, internal in relation to the senses. He whose pragna awareness in dream takes the forms of the impressions in that internal mind is anta pragna, aware of internal objects. He is called taijasa, luminous, since he becomes the witness of the modes of cogitation that is bereft of objects and appears only as a luminous thing. As Vishva is dependent on objects, he experiences the modes of gross cognition, whereas the awareness that is experienced here consists of mere impressions, and hence the enjoyment is subtle. The rest is common with the earlier paragraph. Taijasa is dvitiya padaha, the second quarter. Namaste. So let's review real quickly what we've gone over in the last couple of videos about consciousness. First of all, we have the four states of consciousness: Jagrat, Swapna, Sushupti, and Turiya. And so far, we've gone over Jagrat, waking consciousness of the things in the world, which is called Vaishvanara or Virat, because it is the all-pervading. World awareness through the senses and its locations within the eye. Now we're looking at svapna, dreaming consciousness, is of the mind and thoughts, and this is called taijasa, which means self-effulgent, and its location is within the mind. So these two states of consciousness are the most familiar to all of us. Everybody is awake during the day or during their time of activity. And then they have to go to sleep <laughs> at night or when they rest. So this is the daily cycle, and these are the most accessible, easily understood states of consciousness. Now, one thing that's not mentioned here in the text is that in the state of dream consciousness, swapna, the emotions, the feelings, are very prominent. Even though theoretically, any of the nineteen sense inputs can manifest in a dream form as an impression, without the actual sense inputs being present, still we notice that they tend to concentrate on vision, 
and hearing. I can't recall any dreams where I've had, for example, scents or odors or tastes. But even though those inputs are absent, dreams are very intense emotionally, perhaps because of their abstract nature, because they're only impressions and not actual sense inputs. And psychology has taken advantage of this for years to help people get in touch with their feelings. Because in ordinary waking consciousness, we tend to overlook our feelings in pursuit of various goals in the material world. And of course, in the long term, this is not healthy psychologically. So dreams are an important opening into our emotional life. Just last night I had a dream about my goddess. I was coming to see her, and we got started talking about relationships. And I was trying to tell her, you know, as a human being, <laughs> with a limited scope of awareness and uh, a very small uh, area of cognizance within the senses, we are often surprised by the things that happen. We can't see it coming. We try to predict, and especially in relationships, we try to manage the emotions, but we're usually unsuccessful, and something comes along that's completely surprising and unsettles us and so on like this. I was trying to explain to her, because, you know, she's all cognizant, and she knows everything, so I was trying to explain what it's like as a human being, why we like to have commitments in relationship, why we like to have, you know, kind of like a formal definition, well, this is what the relationship is about, and this is what we do together, and like that. Whether it's a friendship, or a parenthood, or a marriage relationship, or whatever kind of relationship, we like to make things clear. So that is one of the things about emotions, is that emotions respond to the present situation without any plan or without any thought as to how these emotions come to arise. They simply are a response to the direct situation without any intervening thought. And this is what makes them extremely useful for all kinds of things especially for a creative person, revealing the intuition that is at the root of the creative process. I have to tell you, so many times I've gotten stuck in a project and gone and taken a nap or had a good night's sleep and in the morning come back to it and, oh, yeah, of course, that's the solution. That's the next step or whatever the problem is happens so often that our indwelling intuitive intelligence, which is so much greater than ordinary human intelligence, comes up during sleep. And this is because sleep and dreams are a gateway to levels of awareness that are ordinarily blocked in waking consciousness. So to access these levels, one can use hypnosis or drugs, but, you know, these are not so good because they're external dependencies. It's better to let go of all dependencies, sink into Svapna consciousness, and allow these feelings to surface and become accessible. And then we can take advantage of them to solve our problems. This was one of the big breakthroughs of Freudian psychotherapy and Jungian dream work that dreams are important inputs and they should be paid attention to. They should be understood, even journaled, kept records about, and so on, because they're such a valuable input to our whole process of trying to understand ourselves, trying to understand life. <laughs> so this is the second quarter of Brahman this Svapna or dream consciousness. 
And in the next couple of shlokas, we'll go into sushupti, which is deep sleep consciousness, which is the gateway to the other two. And it's very interesting how it's described in the tika that sleeping is present in all three modes of conditioned consciousness, even what we call so-called waking consciousness, <laughs> because we're not fully aware. The full awareness happens only in Brahman, in Turiya, and that's the highest state of consciousness in which the actual self-realization can occur. So, stay with us. We're working through all these basics, which are so fundamental to the whole Vedic point of view. Now, I'm astonished that more teachers don't go into this. They don't seem to be aware of it themselves. And they pretty much assume that everything is based on waking consciousness, whereas that's not true at all. It's actually based on Turiya. But if you don't practice Samadhi, you don't have access to Turiya. And so the present-day yogis who claim to be teaching Ashtanga Yoga, means eight-limbed yoga, they don't teach the higher limbs. Pratyahara, withdrawal of the attention from the senses, and concentration, huh? and what to speak of samadhi, real meditation. So this is real yoga. This is the object of yoga. And why they don't teach it is because they don't practice it themselves. Anyway, we do. And so we're very happy to share these things with you so that you can attain the highest states of enlightenment. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya.